Good morning, my Hebrews and my Shalomi homies. If you're new here, yes, those are words. They're sounds anyway, I don't know if they're words. They're our words. Good morning, we're in Joshua this morning, which means that we have completed the entirety of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the law, the books of Moshe, Moses. I don't know if I'm happy or if I'm sad about that. It's a milestone anyway. We're in Joshua this morning, which is page 225 in the scriptures. So just out of the Old Testament, we've read 225 pages of this word together. And now we're in what's called the Nevi'im, or the prophets. Now, Joshua is not necessarily a prophet, but he's included in the prophets. It's uh, one of the historical works that is traditionally sorted into the prophets by the Jews. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and something else. Chronicles. There we go. As my pastor says, more thinking juice. There we go. All right. Let's read Joshua. By the way, Get your Bibles out. And it came to be after the death of Moshe, Moses, the servant of Yahuwah, the Lord your God, that Yahuwah spoke to Yehoshua, to Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moshe, saying, Moshe, my servant is dead. So now arise and pass over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, to the children of Israel. Every place on which your soul, on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given you, as I spoke to Moshe. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, it is your border. Great, great sea toward the going down of the sun, so that'd be the west, the great sea to the west from there would have been the Mediterranean. In fact, the scriptures, my copy, has 47,000 notes in it, but if you see here in the back, there's a map, and see it says the Great Sea, Medi Mediterranean. <gasps> his word is possessed. No, it's just his hand slipped. Uh, the Great Sea to the West <laughs> is the Mediterranean. So, there are maps in the back of the scriptures. Yet another reason I love this copy of the Word. And for those that are new, I'm reading out of the scriptures. You can get it at wwwmessianic dash. No, yeah. ISR. India Sierra Romeo dash messianic dot org. You can also get it in the store at bearindependent.com uh, for our cost. We don't we don't make money on Bibles. We're not trying to make money on Bibles. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> no man, verse five, is going to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moshe, so I am with you. I do not fail you nor forsake you. Now we're going to get into something here. In fact, we're going to pause and actually skip over something to make a point. There is a phrase, there's a verse that is wholeheartedly 
taken out of context constantly and consistently by the modern church. And I say the modern church, this may have been happening for thousands of years. I don't know. I am not immortal. I've not been around for thousands of years, but I have been around for uh, a while. I've spent several decades in and out of the church. And I have heard this verse bantied about, painted on walls, written on scrolls, inscribed into wood and stone. I have seen this verse everywhere by Bible thumping Sunday Christians. Joshua 1 verse 9. I'm sure if you've been around the faith a while, you've heard it too. You may not have known where it's come from, but here it is. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor discouraged for Yahweh your Elohim, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, listen guys, don't worry. The Lord is with you. Be strong and courageous. He is with you wherever you go. Yes, however, this is conditional. You mean the love of God is conditional? That's what this entire book is about. Shocker, I know. That's why, at least in the dozens of different churches that I've been in, and the hundreds if not thousands of different services I've attended, the vast majority, I can name two assemblies, not even churches, assemblies, because there is a difference. I can name two assemblies that I know of, of the 38 different states that I've lived in, and the hundreds of churches and thousands or dozens of churches, hundreds if not thousands of sermons I've heard. I can name two that actually just sat down and said, let us read the Bible and see what this thing says. The rest of them aren't doing that because when you do that, it starts to put the lie to the doctrines and dogmas of men. So, now, starting at verse 6 of Joshua. This is the conditional. And I'm promising you, the next time you hear somebody bring this up, you need to tell them not to quote this out of context. Do not quote just Joshua 1, 9. Start at Joshua 1, 6 through 1, 9. Be strong and courageous, for you are to let this people inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be very strong and very courageous to guard to do according to all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it right or left so that you act wisely wherever you go. Do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you guard to do according to all that is written in it. For then, for then, you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, nor be discouraged, for Yahuwah your Elohim is with you wherever you go. I'm just going to pause a brief moment so I can pontificate. The very same people that will inscribe this Joshua 1 9 verse everywhere, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous, are the same people that will tell you that the law was done away with and nailed to the cross because they have zero understanding of Colossians 2 14 because, again, they don't read anything in context, they cherry pick verses. Well, conditional here is only be strong and very courageous to guard to do according to all the Torah, which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it right or left so that you act wisely wherever you go. Do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you guard to do according to all 
that is written in it, for then, for then, you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. Nor be discouraged, for Yahweh your Elohim, the Lord your God, is with you wherever you go. The very same people who want to tell you that Joshua 1 verse 9 is still in play. Have I not commanded you? The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Will tell you that verses 1, 6 through 8 are done away with because of Yeshua. Explain that to me without jumping through any doctrinal hoops, without bringing up any dogma of men, just using this Bible. Matthew 5, 17, I come not to destroy the Torah or the prophets, but to complete play ra'u, the Greek word, I love it, play ra'u, be a great ba uh, brand name. Playrau.com. People will be like, how the hell do I spell that? <laughs> Sounds like, like a Danish brand or something. Playrau. <sighs> Complete. To completely be it. So Messiah didn't do away with the Torah of prophets. He says, truly, truly, till heaven and earth passes away. The same heaven and earth that Moses calls to witness in Deuteronomy 33 and Deuteronomy 32 where Moses is just, you know, giving the best pep talk ever. He's just laying a smack down on the Israelites. And he calls heaven and earth to witness against them. And the reinforcing of this law, it's the same heaven and earth that Yeshua says in Matthew 5, 18, till heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle, not even the tiniest mark of the Torah shall pass away till all be done. Well, all ain't be done yet. Heaven, I've never been there. Earth is still here. Clearly, there are still things going on. And people would make the argument that, well, what he meant was... <laughs> Tell me what he meant 2,000 years later, not having walked with him daily for three years, been one of his apostles, not having read the entirety of this book. Tell me what he meant. What he meant was the work that he did on the cross. That's what he meant by all be done. Is heaven still here? My guess is, yeah. Is earth still here? I'm gonna go with, yeah. And by the way, the men who walked with him daily for years still got Yeshua wrong. He was constantly rebuking them, constantly, because they were getting it wrong. And now you're gonna reverse engineer what you think he said 2,000 years later to suit your doctrines and dogmas of men. It's a very dangerous game to play. That's why we read things in context, because the likelihood of getting this stuff wrong is very high. It's even higher when you don't read things in context, when you just cherry pick verses and use them like Legos. I like this piece and I like this piece and I'm gonna build this little thing that I call my personal faith and this is what I believe. Well. That's why Yeshua says in Matthew 7, 24, depart from me, you who work lawlessness, for I never knew you. Because that thing that you built, your little build-a-bear of faith, I like this piece and this piece and this, is not biblically sound. It might have come from the Bible, but it's not biblically sound. Those are two very different things. And the reason I bring that up is because this is an egregious example right here in Joshua 1 9. I realize we're 15 minutes deep already and I apologize for pontificating, but this is what happens. This is the difference between spirituality, a personal relationship with Yeshua and with Yahuwah and religion. Religion says, take this one piece, cut paste, put it over here, boom. Now we have a doctrine of faith. Spirit spirituality says, I love Yahuwah, my Elohim so much. I'm going to do whatever I can to serve him. I love Yeshua, my Redeemer, so much. I'm going to do whatever I can to walk in his footsteps. First Peter 2.21, for this we were called, that Messiah having suffered for our sins, that we might walk in his steps. Paraphrasing, 
that we were dead to our sins. First John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. We were dead to our lawlessness, but now we might live unto righteousness. Luke 1, 6, righteousness is blamelessly walking in the commands of the Most High. So we were called to follow in the footsteps of Messiah because we were dead in our lawlessness and now we're being called to keep the commands. Roger that. That's straight up biblical. There's very few places on this planet you'll hear that. You're definitely not going to hear that in church. And the reason you're definitely not going to hear that in church is because people don't read their whole Bibles. They cherry pick. And so you see here the condition of 1-9, Joshua 1-9, is only be strong and very courageous to guard to do according to all the Torah. It's not something that just happens. This strong and courageous, this power and authority that comes from the Father, it's not something that's just gifted to you. It's there. You can tap into it. But Yahweh your Elohim goes before you. He is with you wherever you go. If, 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 well, that's a workspace theology. That's conditional. It's also what your Bible says. Page after page after page, chapter after chapter, book after book after book, from the first page of this book to the last page of this book. That's why you read in context. Okay. Coffee time. By the way, thank you again for these cups, brother. They're freaking awesome. Very, very good. <coughs> and Yehoshua, Joshua, commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare food for yourselves. For within three days you are passing over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you to possess. So he tells the officers, hey man, make some grub. Three days, we're going to cross the river. And Yehoshua spoke to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, saying, Remember the word which Moshe, servant of Yahuwah, commanded you, saying, Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you rest, and he shall give you this land. Let your wives, your little ones, and your livestock stay in the land which Moshe gave you behind, beyond the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brothers in fives, all your brave fighters, and shall help them until Yahuwah has given your brothers rest, as unto you. So shall they also take possession of the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession, and you shall possess that which Moshe, the servant of Yahuwah, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the rising of the sun. So that sounds like a mouthful, but essentially what happens here is as they're splitting up the land, which is split up by tribe, split up by inheritance. And again, we have maps here in the back of this book. Let me see if I can find the one that I'm looking for. That uh, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Benessa were essentially, here it is, were going to stay on the east side of the Jordan. And they said... Because they're looking around, they and they had lots of livestock. And they're like, bro, these pastures are the bomb. What we got to do to get these pastures, yo, Moshe? And Moshe was like, boom. You can have these pastures, but you keep your flocks, your herds, your wives, your children, your old people here east of the river. And all you guys are going to put on your kit and you're going across the river and you're going to go in there and help your brothers fight for their land and then you can come back. And the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of Benassa were like, hell yeah, we'll go first. <clears throat> that was the commitment they made. They said, absolutely. Not only will we go, we'll go first. We'll be the pointy end of the spear. We'll go and we'll clear out for everybody else. And then our brothers, the rest of our tribe, can come in behind us and establish themselves, be, you know, the rear end of the line, supply chain, logistics, the whole nine. But we'll go first. And so Joshua's reminding them, he's like, hey, guys, it's time. You still going to go first? Because that's what we talked about. If you want to stay on this side of the river, y'all got to go first. And so here's the map that I was talking about right there. And so you can see East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben are all on one side of the river. 
that's the side of the river that they're already on. And they're going to be going across the river over here to the promised land. And they're going to clear out all of this for all these other tribes. Okay? So that's what they're talking about. Yet another reason why I love the scriptures. Because it's cool. It, like, it helps if you're a visual person. You're like... Yeah, man, that was good blah, blah, blah of the Hebrew words for the last 10 verses. What does it mean? Well, that's what it means. <clears throat> okay, verse 16. And they answered Yehoshua, Joshua, saying, All that you have commanded us, we do. And wherever you send us, we go. They're like, you got it, boss. According to all that we obeyed Moshe, so we obey you. Only let Yahweh your Elohim, it's interesting how they say, this is a quote, only let Yahweh your Elohim be with you as he was with Moshe. They're like, man, whatever you say we're going to do, just let Yahweh who is with Moshe be with you. Now, of course, we have that at the beginning here in Joshua. Um, Verse 5, no man is going to stand before you all the days of your life. This is Yah speaking to Joshua. As I was with Moshe, so I am with you. I do not fail you nor forsake you. That's <laughs> brief aside. Imagine you're a mere mortal and your, your boss, your mentor, guy you spent 40 years with, and service to, at least, has just passed away. And you inherit essentially this empire of millions of people, tens of millions of animals, and what's gonna be, you know, millions of square miles of land. And your boss just died. Your mentor just died. And now it's on you. How awesome is it to know to have Yahuwah, your Elohim, speak to you personally and go, bro, I got you. I do not fail you, nor forsake you. That's good to know. What a pep talk, man. And you know, those short little snippets is how Yah talks to me. Brevity code. I do not fail you nor forsake you. And so what the Reubenites, Gadites, and half of Manasseh are saying, they're like, man, we will go wherever you go. We will do whatever you tell us to do. We're good, man. As long as you got Yah, as long as you're the guy who's working with Yah, we're good. According to all that we obeyed Moshe, so we obey you. Only let Yahweh your Elohim be with you, as he was with Moshe. Whoever rebels against your mouth and does not obey your words, and all that you command him is put to death. Only be strong and courageous. How about a little bit more context, modern church? Whoever rebels against your mouth and does not obey your words in all that you command him is put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Well, that's what Jesus did. He removed that death. That's why we don't have to follow the law anymore. Uh-uh. He has blotted out what was written against us by hand. Colossians 2.14. What was written by hand is what was nailed to the cross. Who wrote the commandments? written with the finger of Elohim. What was written by hand means written by men. It's the doctrines and dogmas of the Yehudim, the Yehudi, the Jews, the legalists who made up lots and lots and lots of extra rules. Not the Father's perfect law. And so the death sentences that they were earning literal death sentences that they were earning from the Yehudi, the Jews, for not keeping their doctrines and dogmas of men were done away with by the sacrifice of Yeshua, 
who was the prophesied Messiah, who is a king that returns the father's people, Israel, which is us right now. Israel literally means he who overcomes with Elohim to the father. Good news. Kings have rules. Kings have laws. However, Yeshua says, come to me, all ye who labor, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But people ignore the fact that there's a yoke, there's a burden. But that yoke, that burden is a blessing. <clears throat> How are you supposed to play the game when you don't know what the rules are? What's sin? Well, brother, sin is anything you do that makes God angry. Sin is falling short of the mark. What mark? Well, you know that. No, I don't know. Well, you see that. No. How about you? Open your Bible. You flip to 1 John 3, 4. I'll wait. Sin is transgression of the law. Any, anyone who does sin also does lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It's lawlessness. And so the Christian church post-Constantine, <clears throat> so from 312 AD onward, is founded in the concept of lawlessness. As if lawlessness is the type of thing that your redeemer and creator would encourage you to do. Yeah, y'all go be outlaws. Have fun with that. If you read the entirety of this book and you read it in context, you will find that lawless people get schwacked one after the next after the next. And I believe this is why in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the remnant of the church being those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, and keep the commands, both, not one or the other, both. There's a lot of lawless people who think they're good to go, who think they've got their fire insurance, who think that their salvation is squared away, and I don't believe so. And I'm not saying that because, and I'll unpack this too, so just stand by. Matthew 7, 21. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness, for I never knew you. This is Jesus speaking. Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I shall say to them, Depart from me, you who work lawlessness, for I never knew you. Get away from me, you people who aren't keeping the law. Now, and he literally goes on to say, There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because people think they're good to go and they're not. Well, that's a works-based theology. That's not how sal salvation works. Spend the next 14 hours on this. First of all, faith without works is dead. James 2, starting at verse 14 through the end of the chapter. Just as a body is dead without a soul, so is faith without works dead. So faith without works is dead. So don't talk to me about works. You say you have faith, I will show you my faith by my works, which is what James, Jacob, the literal blood bro brother of Yeshua, who walked around the face of the earth with the man, had to send the subject. So I'm going to take his opinion over it, uh, on it, rather than anybody else's, okay? Next, 1 Peter 2.21, For this you were called, the Messiah having suffered for your sins, that we might walk as he walked, that we might walk in his steps, that in him was no sin. What sin? 1 John 3, 4, transgression of the law. That we, having been dead in our sins, our lawlessness, might live unto righteousness. Luke 1, verse 6. And you guys can look all this up on your own, and I would encourage you to do so. Don't subcontract your faith to me, and don't take my word for it. Luke 1, verse 6. Righteousness is blamelessly walking in all the commands of Yahuwah. So your faith... In Yeshua, by grace, through faith, we are saved, says Paul, mm -hmm. Shaul of Tarsus. By grace, through faith, by the grace of Messiah, you 
are not going to suffer the death sentence that you've earned. It was nailed to the cross, which was a stake, by the way, not a cross. But I digress. It was nailed to the stake so that literally 1 Peter 2.21. Go read 1 Peter 2.21 on to the end of 1 Peter 2. Just read the end of that chapter. So that you might live unto righteousness. So that you, in your lawlessness, earned a death sentence. And that's what Yeshua did away with. And what's left is for you. The reason he did that is so that you might live unto righteousness. And the final proof of this is in Hebrews 8, verse 6 through 12. In fact, you can go verse 6 through 13. Because it lays out in verse 6 that Yeshua is the mediator of a renewed covenant. You say, well, that's all old covenant stuff. Yeshua, Jesus, is the mediator of the renewed covenant. Copy that. Hebrews 8.8. 8. What is the condition of the renewed covenant? Not like the covenant that I made with uh, the children of Israel when I brought them out of the land of the Mitzrayim by a strong hand. No, not that. 8.10. And I shall make with the house of Israel a new covenant with the house of Israel. Not the Pentecostals, the Mormons, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Catholics. The house of Israel. I shall make with the Father's chosen people, with the house of Israel, a renewed covenant. Having their laws in my mind. Having the Yahuwah, the Lord your God, having his laws in your mind and written on your heart. And then he will be our Elohim and we will be his people. So this belief in Yeshua belief should spur you to works James and those works should be in line James 2 14 and those works should be in line with what Messiah did first Peter 2 21 because for this you were called the renewed covenant Hebrews 8 6 through 8 13 so that being dead to sin first John 3 4 which is lawlessness you might live unto righteousness. Luke 1, verse 6. Walking blamelessly in the commands. Now, good news. You're going to F it up. Me too. But it's the condition of your heart and trying to be obedient and to serve the Father that matters. That you are diligently trying to keep the Father's commands and do His things and to serve Him. And then... It says in Hebrews 8, 12, he will, he will remember our sins and our lawlessness. He will. Yahuwah will. So how does Yeshua remove sin from the world? And again, what's sin? It's lawlessness. How does he remove lawlessness from the world? Well, he just said it suffered on the cross. What cross? It suffered on the stake to remove the sins of the world. How? We did away with your death sentence and he lived unto righteousness. And we're supposed to emulate that as followers of Christ. That's what Christian means, by the way. It's derived from the, a derogatory Greek term, Christios, which means those people who were trying to be like Christ. Are you trying to be like Christ? Or are you just phoning it in and letting his blood sacrifice atone for you? Because there's a verse for you, too, on that. And that's Hebrews 10, 26. I felt like that needed to come out and I feel like there's somebody here <clears throat> that needs to dive into their Bible with all those verses and come to a fullness of understanding so all right Joshua verse 2 or chapter 2 now we get the story of Rahab and Joshua the son of Nun secretly sent out two men from Shittim to spy, saying, Go, see the land and Jericho. And they went, and they came to the house of a woman, a whore, and her name was Rahab. And they laid down there. There are people who will say, See, already these Israelites, they're laying with whores. They laid down there. They did not lay down with her. But it was reported to the king of Jericho, saying, See, men from the children of Israel... And it's incredible to me that they're still referred to as the children of Israel because Israel was Jacob. When you tangle with Yah, you get a new name. Israel was Jacob. J 
Jacob was Israel. And his children, his 12 children, became the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they are literally the children of Israel. See, men from the children of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken two men and hid them. So she said, The men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. Then it came to be as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, so that you overtake them. I don't know where they went. They ran that way. You guys should run that way too and get them. But she had brought them up on the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid out on the roof. And the men pursued them by the way to the Jordan, to the fords. And they shut the gate afterwards as soon as the pursuers had gone out. And before they lay down, she came up to them to the roof. And she said, see, again, they were laying down. Not with her. <laughs> she came up to them on the roof. And she said to the men, I know that Yahuwah has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of you. For we have heard how Yahuwah dried up the water of the sea of reeds for you when you came out of Mitzrayim and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and of Og, who was the giant Og of Bashan, whom you put under the ban. By the way, under the ban is a polite phrase for utterly destroyed. And when we heard, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in anyone because of you. For Yahweh, your Elohim, he is Elohim of the heavens above and on the earth beneath. There's that phrase again, the heavens and earth. For Yahweh, your Elohim, he is the Yahweh, he is the Elohim, the Lord our God of the heavens above and the earth beneath. Till heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the Torah till all be done. You know why? Because the Torah comes from Yah. So what was blotted out, what was written by hand against you, Colossians 2.14, did not come from Yah. It came from broken men trying to build a busted up religion out of the Father's perfect law. That's what was done away with on the cross. The legalism of religiosity was destroyed by Yeshua. And that's why the religious zealots that were the Yehudim, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the high priests, hated him. That's why they murdered him, because he was upturning, he was upsetting their apple cart. He was undermining their authority, and he was proving to people that the Father's perfect law was correct. He was restoring people. Through, he was in the, sa in the temple on the Sabbath teaching Torah people over and over and over. Read the Gospels. As was his custom, he was in the temple on the Sabbath teaching. What do you think he was teaching? Algebra? He was teaching the Torah. In fact, they marvel all the time. They being the Pharisees, they marvel. They're going, how, did this, how does this guy know the Torah? We didn't teach him the Torah. And he says, no, my doctrine is not mine. It's the one of, it's, my doctrine is of the one who sent me. Yahuwah, God, he already knew because the Torah comes from God. He already knew it because Yeshua came from God till heaven and earth passes away. Not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the Torah till all be done. And here's Rahab once again affirming this. And when we heard our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in anyone because of you, for Yahuwah your Elohim, he is Elohim in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Amen. And he was then. And he is now. And he will be forever and ever. Amen. And now, please swear to me by Yahuwah, since I have shown you loving commitment, that you also show loving commitment to my father's house, and she'll give me a true token, and she'll spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have, and she'll deliver our lives from death. She said, look, we realize that Yahuwah is the one true God. He's sovereign over everything, heavens and earth, man. And we know you Israelites are a bunch of bad mamma jammas. You guys put Og of Bashan under the ban. You've completely destroyed Sihon. 
we don't want any of that. And we know you're coming here too. We know that the people are going to melt away before you. And uh, I've helped you. Can you help me? Can you not murder my entire family and me included? And the men said to her, our lives for yours. If you do not expose this matter of ours, then it shall be when Yahuwah has given us the land, we shall treat you in loving commitment and in truth. So she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall and she dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, go to the mountain, lest the pursuers come upon you and you shall hide there three days until the pursuers have returned and afterwards go on your way. Y'all go to the mountain, stay there three days, okay? These guys are looking for you. When they come back here, which would be about three days, then y'all go and head home. And the men said to her, we are released from this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household to this home. And it shall be that anyone who goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood is on his own head, and we are innocent. And anyone who is with you in the house, his blood is on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you expose this matter of ours, then we shall be released from your oath, which you made us swear. And she said, let it be according to your words. And she sent them away and they went and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. So they said, look, this is again, very tactical, practical. It may not sound like it, but it is. They see this rope that we just climbed down, this red rope, tie this red rope in your window. So we'll remember this is the house. And we'll tell everybody when you see a house with red rope tied in the window, don't go in there. And as long as you and your whole family is inside the house, you're fine. If they come outside of this house, we can't be held responsible for what's going to happen. That's on you. But what's on us is to not harm anybody inside of this house where the red rope is laying. Is that agreeable? She says, yep, that's agreeable. Rather than, well, my uncle Bob lives over there. Don't destroy him. And aunt Susie lives over there. Don't destroy him. And my third cousin twice removed lives over here. Don't No, They're like, get everybody into one house. That's on you. You get all the people that you want saved in this house, hang the red rope in the window so that we know, and we will pass over, hmm, covered by the red, hmm, we will pass over, judgment will pass over this house. How indicative of Exodus 12, interesting. And why is this? Because Rahab had faith that Yahuwah was the true Elohim, sovereign over the heavens and the earth, and that faith spurred her to action. And therefore, she was blessed. Imagine that. So they left and came to the mountain and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers sought them in all the way, but did not find them. Then the two men returned and came down from the mountain and passed over. And they came to Yehoshua, the son of Nun, and related all to him that had befallen them. And they said to Yehoshua, Truly, Yahuwah has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land have melted away because of us. You're like, yeah. Our reputation precedes us. That's the end of chapter two. They know we're coming. And they're worried about it. Only be strong and courageous. Have I not commanded you? to guard, to do this Torah and all the commands. You know, when I play devil's advocate with myself all the time, people like to throw verse after verse after verse, especially Pauline verses, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians. I said, well, you don't understand because Paul said, yeah, you know, I've, I've read all of those four times and, uh, I'll read them again, and I often do just go back and read them again. Just to make sure that I'm in the right place spiritually and to make sure that I'm not passing bad information to anybody else. Now again, don't subcontract your faith to me. 
That's between you and y'all. But I'm well aware that per the book of James, teachers, and I'm Brother T, not Pastor T, but teachers are held to a higher standard. So I do a good bit of research about all these things that people send to me about, well, you see, Paul said, and that's generally the crux of the argument, well, Paul said. Well, Paul was a Pharisee who was trained in the Torah, lived the Torah. By the way, again, as we've seen over and over and over again, Paul The Torah is something you do. You guard to do the Torah. You do not simply just talk about it. You do not simply just research it. You do not simply just give a sermon on it. You do it. You have to do it. Guard to do all these commands. And Paul did. And in fact, in Acts 15, verse 15 through 19, they make it clear, what do the Gentile believers need to do who are coming to believe in Messiah? abstain from idolatry, abstain from whoring, abstain from strangulation, abstain from blood, and then go to the temple on the Sabbath and hear the words of Moshe. All of that is Torah. So what do these Gentile believers in Messiah, in Jesus, need to do to join the church, to join the assembly? These five things, all of which are Torah. Acts 24, verse 14. Hell, I'll tell you. The words of Paul himself... And this is why, again, it's dangerous to take things out of context. Because Paul, well, I'll use his words. The idea, the idea that Paul would be advocating against the Torah is absurd. Acts 24, starting verse 14. And this, this is Paul speaking. Shaul of Tarsus. And this I confess to you. That according to the way, capital W, way, remember Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, the life. According to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers. The who? I worship the Elohim of my fathers. Yahuwah or Elohim. Believing in all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets. So this I, this I confess to you. That according to the way which they call a sect. He is a believer in the way. Yeshua is the way, the truth, the life. I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets. So step one right there is that Paul, the first thing he says is this I confess to you. I worship the Elohim of my fathers and I believe in all of the Torah and the prophets. I thought it was done away with. I thought it was nailed to the cross. Uh, I thought it, that was all covered by the blood of the Lamb. Nope. This I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets. Verse 15. Having an expectation in Elohim, which they themselves also wait for. They themselves. For there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both the righteous and the unrighteous. And then this, I exercise myself to have a clear conscience towards Elohim and men always. So Paul believes, believing in all the Torah and the prophets, and he has an expectation in Elohim for the resurrection of the dead. So Paul believes in the Torah, the prophets, the resurrection. And so Yeshua, said, when he says in Matthew 5, 17, that I came not to destroy the Torah, the prophets, but complete it, you get the Torah, the prophets, the resurrection. When Yeshua is transfigured on the mount, the Mount of Transfiguration, who's there with him? Moses, Moshe, and Elijah, Eliyahu. Elijah and Moses, the Torah, the prophets, and the resurrection. Moses, Elijah, Yeshua. There are two men outside the tomb when the stone is rolled away. Angels who are standing there. When Mary Magdalene and Miriam, Yeshua's mother, 
come to the tomb. I believe those two men were Moshe and Elijah and Yeshua, the Torah, the prophets, the resurrection. The two witnesses in Revelation and end times who preach uninterrupted on the Temple Mount. Strong belief by many, many people who are much smarter than I am that those are Elijah and Moses. And what are they doing? They're preaching the return of Yeshua, the Torah, the prophets, the resurrection. It's about a fullness of understanding. Paul understood it. What was missing from the Torah and the prophets was the resurrection. What is missing today for everybody who believes in the resurrection, as you should, is the Torah and the prophets. And so back then, they had the Torah and the prophets. They didn't have the resurrection. And they did not have a completeness of understanding. Today, we have the resurrection, but by and large, we don't have the Torah and the prophets. And so there isn't a completeness of understanding. And that's what I believe. I believe this whole book. I do not believe it's a coincidence that they bind the entirety of it in one binding and that they separate it by one page. It's what? You need a micrometer to figure out how thin it is. As if it's somehow a coincidence. And the idea that the Jews read the front half of the book and the Christians read the back part, it's bull. And I could talk about that for hours more but I won't. I'll instead encourage y'all to have a happy and blessed Sabbath. Shalom.